Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode, Reverts Reality. Today we are on episode number 45, subhanAllah. And so today um, we thought it was very important for us to address some of the many questions that you guys have sent. And so we have none other than um, our beloved Ustad Isa Bint Mata from Why Islam Dallas, and I'm here with my co-host, Sister Arenda Dhaka. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I know it's Women's History Month, so uh, we'll make sure that we ibn Mata. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> if we bint Mata, then that means we're the daughter. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. <laughs> yes, you're right. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan for having me. It's always an honor, and... Uh, uh, I love uh, being here for this. It's, it's the highlight of my week, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So, um, so last week, Sister Arenda and I were able to go through some of the rights um, of women that Islam brought to women. And, you know, we spoke about divorce and we spoke about the, the right to own property, you know, the right to keep our last names um, and so on and so forth. So that's what we talked about last week. And we tried to address some of the uh, rights of women in Islam. And so today we want to focus more on your questions because we did receive a lot of questions. And so we thought it was important for us to um, make sure to have a scholar here to answer those questions and um, Hopefully, if you have any other questions, please send them in the comments and we'll try to address all of them in this short span of an hour. We do have um, uh, a number of questions, so please bear with us. And don't forget to um, share this video out um, because many of these questions will be, inshallah, beneficial for many of the sisters out there uh, who might have these questions and not have a place to go and ask them. So let's start with the first one, Sister Arenda. Inshallah. All right. So we had some sisters. This is these are kind of common questions that I see in the revert um, uh, groups often, but these were the ones that stood out the most. So the first question we have: uh, What should I do when I'm constantly asked so many questions about Islam by my non-Muslim family and friends, and also by born Muslims? What advice do you recommend? Because I'm a new Muslim and I don't know that much yet. So it's they find it hard to defend their their choice of um, embracing Islam because they're very new still. What advice would you give for them? How to answer those questions? You know, this is something that um, it's never gonna end. People coming and asking you whether it's non-Muslim family, whether it's uh, non-Muslim friends that you knew before taking Shahada. Um, as well as born Muslims coming and asking you different things, both under the pretense of making you defend your choice and also under the pretense of making you defend uh, the extent of what you know or the extent of what you do. Uh, this is something that is never going to end. And it's, it's just uh, from the nature of, of how people view Muslims, both from the non-Muslim side and from the born Muslim side. So my first advice to you would be, um, don't feel like every question you get asked requires for you to be able to give a direct answer back to. One of the things that we try to teach all uh, Muslims, born Muslims, converts, short, uh, like brand new or been Muslim, you know, their whole life, is uh, don't develop your relationship with Islam through Q and A. Don't try to develop your relationship with Islam through first and foremost only asking questions. That's like going to a math class and trying to learn math by only asking questions. You, will, you may learn a lot of things, but you may not learn the things that you need to, right? If I go to a class and I'm like, so what is two? Well, two is what happens when you get one and one. But what about 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5? Is that also two? Yes, that's two as well. No, you follow a, a certain set of curriculum so that your questions make sense within the framework of what it is that you're learning. Otherwise, if you think that your relationship with the religion is only through asking questions, then you may find yourself becoming very skeptical, very cynical, uh, and, and it, it, it may uh, be like a very thin attachment to the faith because at the very uh, high level, imagine having a friend that you only know by asking them questions. It wouldn't be a very good friendship, right? So that's the first side of it. The second side of it is try not to de develop relationships with people where the only relationship you have with them 
is through them asking you a bunch of things. You know, it's, uh, it can put an unnecessary amount of stress and strain on you. And um, a lot of the things that should be answered, you know, come better in the form of like organic discussion anyway. So and I'm not saying to avoid the questions, but, uh, but if you can't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of someone else. So if you're always under fire, you always being interrogated, you always being asked X, Y, and Z by everyone on social media. Oh, sister, mashallah, why did you become Muslim? Hey, I wanted to get your advice on something. Uh, you know, uh, now you're a Muslim. Why did you do that? You know, if that's if that's how it goes, it's going to put too much strain on yourself. And if you always find yourself pouring out of your cup and never putting something back in, then once you're on empty, what do you do? Where will you find yourself spiritually? So, um Try to reduce the number of stressors that, that come into play when it comes to constantly being asked questions about, about Islam. And, and the fundamental basis uh, you know, that you can always utilize when it comes to most questions you'll be asked is, Islam means to attain peace and purity by following the commandments of the creator of everything that exists. And whoever does that is a Muslim. Islam means to attain peace and purity by following the commandments of the creator of everything that exists. And whoever does that is a Muslim. So why am I Muslim? To attain peace and purity. Because I believe in the, uh, the creator of everything that exists. Why do I wear a hijab? It's because that's what the creator told me to do. You notice how you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to answer every question about Islam? Now, um, uh, Sister Nahila, she overpraised me at the beginning. She said, you know, we have a scholar. It's the word scholar is relative, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm well studied in some fields, but, you know, there's a lot of layers to the game. Sometimes you may feel like you're being asked questions that are beyond your scope. Sometimes you may be answering questions that are beyond your scope because uh, the extent of a person's knowledge is also relative too. But if you can always go back to the funda fundamental definition of what Islam is and why you're a Muslim, Islam means to attain peace and purity by following the commandments of everything, of the creator of everything that exists and whoever does that as a Muslim. Now you don't need to know all the proofs for hijab. You do it because it's a command from Allah. You don't need to explain the reason why you pray five times a day is from the commands of the creator of everything that exists. I believe in that. I find peace and purity in this. So uh, just like how people don't get into, es uh, you know, deep eschatology and theolo theology and epistemology on why did you, you were born this gender, but now you identify as that one. People, they don't get interrogated about their own gender fluidity uh, questions and their sexual identity questions. So don't let someone, uh, you know, back you up against the wall and make you feel attacked when it comes to your own spiritual decision-making. No more than we do that for someone based on their sexual decision-making or gender decision-making. And I hope that that answer uh, makes sense and is well received. Mashallah, very good, very good advice. Thank you. Yeah, Mashallah, Alhamdulillah. We couldn't have said it better. Next question. Um, I get told many times, <clears throat> uh, I get told by many of the Muslims around me to say all these phrases, and or duas, a specific amount of times. If I want to go straight to Jannah, how can just saying these things a thousand times or so take me to Jannah? Aren't my actions the rest of my life account for accounted for? You know, I remember when I first became Muslim because uh, early on uh, I divorced social media. You know, it was divorce, divorce, divorce. You know, we we separated and alhamdulillah, it was mutual separation. We've never remarried or even done consultation or anything <laughs> like that. No counseling needed, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and a part of the reason as a new Muslim that I decided to go ahead and uh, make permanent separation with <laughs> social media is because I would get stuff like this. You know, say, uh, read Surah Al-Ikhlas 1,000 times and you will be given any dua that you want like, okay, well, what's the point of making dua on Laylatul Qadr if I can just do this today, you know? Or, uh, you know, if you say this dua a million times, then, the you know, uh, you will be forgiven of all of your sins no matter what you do. It's like, uh, okay. If it doesn't, here's the general rule of thumb. General rule of thumb. If it doesn't make sense, then it probably isn't right. <laughs> if it doesn't make sense, it probably isn't right. You know, uh, because uh, even though we love common sense, common sense is not so common. It's, it's actually quite rare. <laughs> So uh, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably not right. If someone is telling you, say this thing to get to Jannah, when the Prophet Sallallahu he tells us that no matter, uh, that your actions will not even admit you into Jannah, it's only by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's mercy. And the reason why we do everything we do as a Muslim is so that on the day that we meet him, we will be admitted into his mercy as a means of being admitted into Jannah. Then, you know, 
Uh, we don't try to take this one thing and filter all of the religion through this singular lens of understanding. It's very, very dangerous. And so you may have some people who become fixated with something that they found on the internet or something that they heard or when I was growing up, I heard this. And so you should say that. Our religion is not based on what anyone thinks. Our religion is not based on what anyone feels. Because if it was based on what someone else thought or filled, then we could all be doomed. If, if heaven and hell was based on my thoughts and feelings, I'm, I'm not even just enough to myself. Least of all, would I be just enough to you to, to give you what you need to save yourself? I can barely give myself what I need to save myself. You know? So uh, if someone is coming and telling you, this is what you need to do. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. You know, just keep it high level. You know? <laughs> Just give it really high level. Be patient with people who come and try to force these things down your throat. Uh, you never know the psychological or spiritual disposition of the person who is coming and fixated with that one thing, or you should say this and you should do that. Oftentimes, you know, you don't know where someone else is coming from. So be patient uh, in, in dealing with people like that. But if it doesn't make sense, then it's probably not right. So uh, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Yes, it is your whole life. That is what matters. What's between you and Allah is what matters. Not what some random person or even well-known person or whatever came and said, if you don't say this, you can't go to Jannah. Even the Prophet وسلم, did not put that amount of pressure on the Sahaba. And the stakes were much higher in his time than even in ours since they were the whole of Islam. And our Ummah is far more vast. We have way more people now than back then. If, if someone died, it's like you you lost a human resource. It was a completely different ballgame back then, right? So... Um, if he didn't put that amount of pressure on the companions, radiallahu anhum, and Allah didn't put that amount of pressure on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu then don't let anyone come and put that amount of pressure on you. Islam means to attain peace and purity by following the commandments of the creator of everything that exists and whoever does that is, is a Muslim. So if you find someone is putting something on your plate that takes away from your peace and purity, then go ahead and put that to the side. That's his Islam, her Islam, their Islam, other Islam. You know, but this Islam, peace and purity. When you follow it, you will feel that. Uh, anything beyond that, leave that. Mashallah. Mashallah. I think when uh, I first uh, embraced Islam, I came into a lot of those kind of statements by born Muslims and um, with good meaning, you know, they had good intention. But I think that's exactly like um, learning later how Allah says, I made Islam easy, but you guys, you know, you make it difficult. We make it difficult for ourselves. And exactly like you said, it's common sense. Um, so a lot of these things, when you really think it through and you know the basis of your faith, um, it, it's really not, not something that we should be too stressed over, right? Um, I have a question here with our upcoming Ramadan, alhamdulillah, coming up here in just uh, just a little over a month, I believe, right? Um, we have a question from a sister here, and I know I see this question all the time too, is there certain things that women are, um, you know, dismissed from fasting uh, for specific reasons, and one of those is the monthly menses they get. And this sister wanted to know, does she need to make up the days she misses fasting during that time um, in Ramadan. So I know if you if you miss it because you're ill, you're going to make that up. Um, but during the mens menses period, she wants to know, does she need to make up that fasting after Ramadan? Uh, yeah, this is a, an excellent question. And um, there's no difference of opinion that when it comes to our, our sister's monthly cycles, that once uh, this is, uh, if it happens in Ramadan, then they make the days up outside of Ramadan. And they get the same reward as if they had done it in Ramadan. And the, the complete hasanat of the month of Ramadan is given to them when they complete the fast that they made up or that they had to make up. So think about it like this. We know that Ramadan is the month of mercy. We know all of the narrations about the importance of the month of Ramadan. Whoever completes the fasting of the month of Ramadan you know, will have their sins forgiven and so on and so forth. That reward is there is there for you to just complete the fast whether it's three days or 10 days or, or more, you know, uh, just make up those days and you get the same reward and you get the same, uh, you get the reward upon its completion, just like anyone else who completes the entire month or if a person is traveling, if a person is sick and they make up those days, they get the same reward. But a couple of things to note, when you're making up a Ramadan fast, you can't randomly break it. You have to see it through until the end, just like how in Ramadan, you can't randomly break your fast. So for a nuffle fast, for an extra fast, like if you fasting on Thursday, 
and all of a sudden like you start get hypoglycemic headache and you got two hours to go you know what let me just go ahead break some bread that's all you you know you can do that that's no issue but for ramadan fast when you set the intention to do it you have to uh, see it through until the end uh another thing too when it comes to making up those ramadan fast our mother aisha radila anha she used to say that she would wait until the winter to make up her fast in ramadan because the days are shorter so you you can play it as smart as you need to you know you can spread those things out now keep in mind uh, an, an, uh, an obligatory act cannot have hold the same intention as a as a supererogatory act meaning you're making up the six days uh, or you're making up six days of Ramadan cannot be with the same intention of fast in the six days of Shawwal because Ramadan is the obligatory. The days of Shawwal are, are no effort. Or you can't say, well, I'm going to do the three white days with the intention of the white days. In. And, and obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ashakir ashakur. He will uh, you know, reward you according to as much as he wills. But the reward of the obligatory is significantly higher. So the intention for the obligatory has to be set for that. Even if you want to do a Monday, Thursday, because you know people who fast and make it easy on you, you break your fast together, you do a start with them, that's fine. But your intention is for the, is making up the Ramadan fast, right? So what about the case of a person who forgets how many days that they have to make up? Guesstimate. But the same way that you don't play, play around when it comes to tax season and guesstimating how much you're supposed to owe so that you can you don't have to guesstimate how much you may have to pay them so that they can they can calculate how much they're going to pay you, you know? Same way you take care of your, uh, you know, your W-2s and your 1099s and your money when it comes to getting that tax return, the, the return on fast in the month of Ramadan is higher than any money that can be paid to you in this dunya. So take care of those days. Set a reminder in your phone, you know, open up a special, send a text message to yourself, send a text message to a family member, somebody that's in it with you to just make sure like, hey, look, uh, these are the, I, it's 10 days or it's eight days or we were traveling for these days and then the cycle came on for that much. So I owe 10. Like, make sure that you keep track of that, inshallah. So I hope that we answered the question that was asked and the question that wasn't asked. No, mashallah. Can I, can I actually, I have another question in that. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so, because this was asked to me um, recently. Um, so if you're traveling, you make up the days and that sister was saying, I can just feed someone. That is not correct, right? No, if that's you're not traveling. correct. That's not correct. You, you, you do not take the kafara, you do not take the expiation for the fasting of Ramadan unless you physically cannot fast. Okay? It's not option. The, the, the obligation is to fast. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 183, written upon you, fasting like it was written upon those who came before you, so that you may attain taqwa. If there was any conditional article or a ruqsa or a concession, say and if you can't if you if it's too hard for you just feed someone that that wouldn't have been it you got to understand like ramadan ramadan is uh is 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 something that the companions did the the sahaba did in the desert your job is hot in texas i'm sure but it's not a desert not a desert um uh you may work a very very physically taxing job some of the worst wars, the most physically taxing wars that required the most uh, travel, the most uh, strenuous like uh, physical strain on the companions, on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam happened in the month of Ramadan. And even though they could break their fast, they did not. So the best things in life don't come easy. You know? And the reward of Ramadan is one of the best things that you can get in this life. Maybe we should just designate a time to talk about like the, the reward of Ramadan, the benefits of fasting in the month of Ramadan and why it's so important. Because sometimes we become so consumed with the obligation that we try to find ways out. Well, you know, I'm going to travel with it. You know, uh, what's the, I'm, I'm going to go three hours outside of the city. I'll be back. You know, as soon as you get past the city limits, you pull over to Bucky's and you go get you some fudge. Like, come on, man. <laughs> you got to take, take it easy on yourself. Do not filter this religion through the, the, the mindset of a rule set. Understand that the ramifications of our actions are bigger than halal haram. The only reason why we care about halal haram is because of the reward associated with the hereafter. It's the only reason why we care is because of the return to Allah. So it's not it's not to buffet where you know, well, okay, today it's a little rough on me and I work a hard job. So let me just 
there, there are there are concessions, there are exceptions to the rules, but the general rule is we fast, not feed the needy, not make it up. You know, we, we tried to complete it in the show. Just let that hair for that. And yeah, we are gonna have a special on Ramadan, inshallah, towards the end of the month. So stay tuned to that. Uh so uh, the next question, um, I know we did this um, back when uh, a month ago or so was, I have a question about hijab. Does wearing hijab mean just covering your hair? I see many fellow sisters in Islam that still wear clothes that show their shape and their speech is not good, they cursing. Um, are there more blessings uh, than me, even though I do not wear hijab? So basically she's asking, you know, there's people that are wearing it kind of, sort of in a way, but not really. And their mannerism is not going along with it. Um, is there more blessings for someone that doesn't wear it at all? Um, yeah. And, and obviously the clothing. Yeah. So uh, the first, the first, understand it uh like I, I have a scarf right if i if i put the scarf on am i wearing hijab <laughs> sister am i hijabi now no no <laughs> no i'm not because hijab doesn't mean head scarf and even if as a man i wore a full abaya and hijab and all that hijab is something that only is a, is obligated for women so you can see how there's a lot of misconceptions about hijab like men wear hijab too no we don't we don't there's no man hijab it doesn't exist because when Allah talked about hijab in the Quran, he specifically addresses the believing women. It's not, it's, it's, it's just for you. And that's why we call hijab the crown of the Muslim. And we did a lecture on that, uh, actually. Uh, uh, and it's, it's on the Y Islam Dallas YouTube channel as well. So you can check that out. So the problem with these, uh, with, with the perception of hijab is we've turned hijab into something that's qualitative, not quantitative. Because hijab does not mean headscarf. In fact, if, if you want to just take a peek into the psychology of men, and we're talking about from the psychology of personalities, the hair is not the fitna of women for men. Now, a woman may say, well, I know some men, man, trust me, hair is not the problem for men. <laughs> that's not the issue. But that's not the point. You don't wear hijab because of men. You wear hijab because Allah told you to. That's reason numero uno. The byproduct of it protecting you from the gaze of men and stuff like that is just the byproduct of you doing what Allah told you to do. Just like how salah, uh, the byproduct of salah is that it's supposed to be a shield for you, a protection against you from evil. But that's not the reason why you do it. You do it because Allah told you to. And so the byproducts, the fawaid, the benefits that come from that are, are as a result of doing what Allah said. So I just want to clarify that misconception. Hijab does not mean modesty. It doesn't mean modesty. And I know I know people have been saying that for a really long time, and I get it. Hijab, I wear hijab out of modesty. Jazakumullah khairin. There's not a single hadith where the Prophet ever mentioned the word hayat and hijab in the same sentence, or even as a direct correlation specifically for women, because hayat is for men and women. And how we manifest that is not just in our dress. So a person can wear, uh, wear hijab and still be devoid of hayat. But the obligation of wearing hijab still exists. Just like how a man can pray five times a day and still be rude. But the obligation of praying five times a day still exists. So just because you actualize some of a religious ruling does not mean that it will make you a better person. You would hope that the actions of, of worship would be enough to translate to what we find in your heart and to purify it because that's what it's there for. But that's not always the case. In fact, that's the whole thing about a munafiqeen in the Quran. They say and do the actions of Muslims, but in their hearts, they have no faith. So when there is a disconnect between what the, what the tongue says, what the heart says, and what the limbs do between Islam and, and like what Islam says to do and what Islam tells us to stay away from by way of character and manners and so on and so forth, this is the type of hypocrisy. So inversely, I can only be so good of a Muslim brother if I've also left off my obligations to Allah. You understand? So if I'm a, if I'm a, you know, mashallah, you, you're such a good brother, but I don't pray, there's a deficiency in how good I am because I'm willfully leaving off an obligation that Allah had set. Similarly, if I pray, but I'm rude, there's a deficiency 
But we would never, ever say that the person who willfully leaves off the obligation is better than the one who tries their best to at least achieve it, even if it's easier or hard on them. In fact, if it's hard for you to pray, if it's hard for you to wear hijab and you do it, you get more reward than the one that it's easy for because you're struggling with it. Uh, in fact, that's the verse in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 245. Uh, you know, seek help with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with patience when it comes to establishing your prayer. Prayer is hard on everyone except for the khashi'in, for the people who have deep uh, rooted reverence, reverential fear of Allah. Prayer can be hard. But we would never ever say that the one who leaves prayer but has good character is better than the one that's, uh, who, who has good character but doesn't pray. Similarly for hijab. No, sister. Uh, if you have good character and you have good akhlaq, you get a reward that they don't. But leaving off the obligation of hijab means that you are attaining a sin that they are not. So while you may say, okay, well, their hijab hugs their body, okay, well, well, and they curse, and they're rude, and they backbite, and so on and so forth, but I don't wear hijab, and I'm not rude. And I wear loose-fitting, uh, you know, clothes, but I just don't cover my head. Uh, you know, you can't make excuses for Allah's obligations by looking at it through the filter of what you see other people do and not do. Because when you die you will not be asked about them. You'll be asked about yourself. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 14, open your book, read it. You're sufficient as a witness against yourself. So we encourage everyone, especially our sisters, because we know hijab is not easy. And, and, and I'm not saying that as someone who can relate, because like I said, ain't no man hijab. Even if I wear thob and kufi and scarf, I'm still not a hijab. It's something different for you. So the reward that you get being a hijabi is a reward as a man I can never achieve. And Allah had designated that hasanat for you in a way that I can never, ever attain it. You know, just like how men, we pray and we don't have a cycle that stops us from praying. You wear a hijab and you get the reward of that all the time. Every day you do it, you know, and a man can never compete with you in that. That's just between you and Allah. So we encourage you um, to leave off filtering the practices of others through your own lens of practice. Because you will never be asked about what someone else does or doesn't do. And we encourage you to, um, to, to, you know, to, to try to strive to the best of your ability and to make excuses for those who are deficient in their own ability. It's, it's a really, really important thing for us as Muslims to never filter the obligations of Allah through what other people are doing. Yeah. Because it will make you judgmental even if you don't intend to be. Oh. And, and I, I'm a black convert and I wear thobes and I wear kufis and these guys, they shave their beards. I've been growing my beard for since I took my shahada and I can only grow this much. And these guys can grow big beards and they shave it. It doesn't matter. Allah not going to ask me about no one else's beard. Not going to ask me about no one else's thobe. Not going to ask me about anyone else. He's going to ask me about me. And I will be rewarded according to what I did and what I did not do. And they will be rewarded or punished according to what they did and what they did not do. Nafsi, nafsi is what the prophets will say on the day of judgment. Myself, myself. So in this dunya, also have a nafsi nafsi mentality when it comes to that hasanat and what's between you and Allah. So, uh, you know, we ask Allah to make it easy on the sisters who struggle with hijab, to make it easy on you. And we ask Allah to put positive examples of hijabis in your life because everybody needs uh, good role models. And if you can't find it in the amongst the living, then know that there are plenty of positive role models amongst the departed from the salihat, the righteous women who came before, like our mother Miriam, like her mother Um Miriam. Uh, the dua that she made, like the mothers of the believers, like our mother Aisha, like Hafsa, like Um Habiba, like Um Maimuna, like Khadija, radiallahu anhu. You know, we have plenty of, of role models amongst the dead. And as a, as a black Muslim convert who can't find uh, role models amongst the living, we look for role models even uh, ourselves amongst the dead. <laughs> oh, mashallah. <laughs> if you can't find a role model amongst the living, then you look you look to the ones who had come before and Allah had preserved their mention. So there's there's plenty of examples like that. And if you want, maybe we can share like a list of books about righteous Muslim men who had come before. Uh, there's a bunch of books about them. We can share that with Embrace. They can post it on the Facebook and you can benefit from there. Mashallah. Yeah, mashallah. Sorry, that, for, sorry no, for the being wordy. That was, that was good. Um, last week we shared uh, the book of the women around the messenger. Great That's book. a really good book book um mine is over there so sister renda's closer there you go <laughs> yeah we this, this is a really good book mashallah so um yeah jazakallah hair i think it's so important for us to to remember that remember that we will be alone on the day of judgment like no son no daughter no wife no mm -hmm. mother no anything and so i think when we start 
Oh, we lost your sound, Sister Nahela. Your audio cut out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, your audio cut out. <laughs> but yeah, um, while she works on that, I know she'll come back in a second. Um, I think the biggest thing to remember is we're, we are our own biggest competition ourselves. So our goal is to be better than we were yesterday, right? Sister Nahela, you want to go ahead and finish your thought there? Uh, no, I was just saying, we just have to remember that we're going to be alone on the Day of Judgment, right? And so we just have to have that mentality that you just mentioned. And oftentimes we're looking at, you know, our deficiencies, we're trying to put, point them where everywhere else but ourselves and so we have to reroute and that's why reflecting is so important and contemplating and you know um as ramadan approaches this is now a good time for us to start making lists and seeing what are the goals what what am i going to change what am i going to work on and to not only during ramadan but inshallah carry it on to um the rest of the year and your life inshallah um but yeah that was that was just like i heard that absolutely um, and I think it's also an important point, too, for our youth. I noticed my kids asked a lot of questions kind of similar to new Muslims when they first embraced the faith is you're teaching them, uh, you know, whatever Allah is going to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. But they'll see maybe, especially from a convert point of view, they'll see your non-Muslim family doing something and it's easy to tell them, OK, well, because they're not Muslim, they're not following the same, you know, guidelines that we do. But then when you look at the Muslim community or maybe just family members or whatnot, sometimes you have people that are not following that, right? So the kids tend to say, well, why do we have to do it? They're not doing it. And so it's so important to, to teach that, that just like you, both of you said, we're gonna be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not with that person who was not doing it or not with that person that was doing whatever. So I think it's that's a really good point to remember that. Um, okay, on to our next one. And this is a very, very common, I mean, all of them are common, but haram police. Um, we get this all the time in the, the groups uh, constantly. This sister says, what's the best response for me to the haram police around me? Don't they know the Sahaba were converts and treated with utmost respect during their journey? They didn't make overnight changes with all their bad habits. Why are we expected to become saints all of a sudden? You know, there's uh, under the pretense of fairness, like we, we have to look at two sides of, of this coin, right? On one hand, on one hand you have the, uh, uh, we will call them the Haram police, and then, uh, then on the other hand, we will we will talk about the halal lawyers. So you have the haram police that's trying to put you in, in in haram prison, and then we have the halal lawyers for people who try to advocate and, and be the uh, you know the the <laughs> the prosecutor. I've never heard that. I have to write that yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, you got the halal prosecutors uh, that are always trying to stand up and, and make a point for everything. A uh, brother, there's a difference of opinion, brother. There, yeah, yeah, all this type of stuff. Uh, Allah knows what's in the heart, you know, so you get both sides of this yeah. and you're going to run into both and you, you uh, both are extreme. Yeah, both are extreme. If anyone is trying to come and police what you are doing, then this is a good sign that maybe this is a person that you don't necessarily need to be listening to all the time. <laughs> if you got people coming to you and I suffer a lot, you, your thobe is, and, and sister, you're a hijab, and you need to cover your neck. If you got people who are coming in, uh, coming at you like that, then this is a good sign that these are people that maybe you don't need to be listening to. Because can you uh, think about this? 6,600 plus ayats in the Quran. Out of, out of 6,000 plus verses in the Quran, only 600 of them deal with rules. And out of the 600 of them that deal with rules, how many times do you see Allah say, this is haram? In fact, the word haram is used the most in the Quran for Masjid al-Haram. Yeah. It's used for the for the sacred message because when you say something is haram, the ramifications of this are huge. They're massive. If I say something is haram, essentially what I'm saying is if you do this, Allah is displeased with you. Yeah. And you need to reconcile what's between you and your Lord through istighfar and through tawbah, through seeking his forgiveness and repenting to him. How much knowledge do you have of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to feel comfortable to tell people what they what 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 causes him to be displeased with them? This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us in the Quran, who's worse than those who tell a lie upon Allah? Or even in Surah Al-Ma'idah and in Surah Al-Nahl. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids for you to make what is halal haram and for you to make what is haram halal. Just because you Googled something on the internet and you opened two tabs and only read one and a half of them does not mean that you have a well-versed knowledge in what Allah is pleased with and what Allah is displeased with. Just because you opened three tabs on the internet and read uh, two differences of opinion doesn't mean that the difference of opinion is valid or, or even that this is something uh, that you can go back and say, well, the Maliki say and the Hanafi say. Like, we got to be careful, guys. We really need to be careful uh, and, and not think that we can put ourselves in a position to speak on behalf of Allah. In fact, one of the gravest sins that a person can do is say about Allah what they do not have knowledge of. And this is actually found in the verse of Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 31. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I, or the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet to them to say, I've been commanded. And he goes in order. Now, we don't want to turn this into tafsir class. We don't want to start talking about like, you know, different things. But the first thing that's mentioned in the, in the verse is the least of the worst. And the last thing that's mentioned in the verse is the worst of the worst. So the first thing that's mentioned is fuhsh, fuahsh, which is uh, illicit sexual and moral behavior. Okay. So we're talking about zina. You know, we're talking about zina of the eyes, watching dirty stuff, you know, listening to the bad things, like fuhsh in general, immorality. What do you think the last thing in the ayah is according to what's the worst thing in Islam? I, I pose this for my sister. What's the word? Tripping partners. Sure. That's actually the second to last thing that's mentioned in the eye. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Not to set up partners with the law without a clear authority. And the last thing that's mentioned in the eye is to not, and, and don't say about a law what you have no knowledge of. Mm, wow. That's why, you know, Sister Nahila said he's a scholar, relatively. I mean, I, I've studied, but a scholar, I know scholars. I'm not them, you know? So I, when I come and answer these questions, I know it's because they're within my scope. I'm not going to say something that's beyond my knowledge. And even the people who ask me questions will tell you, sometimes I won't answer questions. Even if I know the answer, I won't give an answer. Because not every question is meant to be answered and not everything is meant to be said all the time for any given person. So if you got someone who can't watch their mouth on telling you what's haram, 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 then they're probably somebody that's not really worth listening to. But also avoid the halal lawyer who come and try to say that everything is okay. It's all okay. Allah knows what's in the hearts. It's all about your intention because they're doing the same thing. They're saying about Allah what they don't have any knowledge. It could be that, no, you should not do that. You should not eat that. You should not listen to that. You should not watch that. You should not go there. You should decide to like let this thing go for the sake of Allah. Not every point can be argued for its permissibility. And just because you found two websites that said two different things, does it mean that you have a uh, you can cherry pick whichever one is most convenient for you? So uh, stay away from the haram police. And you know, on the internet, the internet is not a platform designed for, uh, that's conducive with listening. People are not tweeting. People are not on Instagram and comment sections with the intent of being uh, of listening to you. They're reading what you're saying with the intent of responding with what they want to say. So the internet is not a classroom. This is not a platform for you to learn. You know, uh, we know that in Islam, if you don't know a question, you should say, Allahu A'lam. Allah knows best. Uh, uh, the scholars, when they write books and, and they finish a point, they will say, Wallahu Ta'ala A'lam. Allah, the Most High, knows best. And these are people who study 20, 30, 40 years. You know the problem with asking Sheikh Google? Sheikh Google will never say, I don't know. True. <laughs> Think about this. <laughs> And I think about that. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, 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 and uh, you know, we did an interview with Sheikh Saad Hasnain. He said the way that you can trust a scholar is when they eventually will tell you, I don't know. Because you can trust someone who eventually says, you know, I don't know. Allah knows best. Ask someone else. You can't trust Google if, if Google will never tell you, I don't know. This Islamic ruling, you should ask the locally man. Google will never, ever say that. <laughs> it will never say that. It will take you somewhere and give you some answer. So be, be mindful of both and don't let either consume you again. And, and uh, for the last question, we don't think the sister's being judgmental. We're answering her question, but also addressing the people who did not ask so that we all know to be mindful of these characteristics. So it's not directly at the questioner. It's just in general, but uh, the same. Don't be judgmental and then label these people haram police just because they told you that you should not do this. It could be true that you should not do it. And don't label people the halal lawyers because it could be true that this is a valid difference of opinion and that this does require consideration, but neither of them should be your points of reference. 
the Haram police nor the Halab uh, lawyers because neither of them, both of them have fallen into a type of extreme. So ask a human being, ask a person that can respond to you in real time, that can talk to you, can walk you through it according to who you are, your circumstances and where you're at in the game. And I apologize, these answers are a little verbose. We tried to dial it back for the rest. Of the no, no we appreciate it. Actually, we're getting, um, you know, people are really enjoying this. And, and I think it's important for us to, um, you know, look at the court thing. I think one of the things for me, um, I was very clear when I went to Mexico and, and my family would like bombarded me with questions. And I said exactly that. I said, you know, one of the things that my religion tells me is I can't speak out of thin air mm -hmm. and I have to have facts for you. And if I don't have them, I'll get back to you. You know that my family respected that more than me coming out and trying to you know, pull this and that and tell them they're like, really? And I said, yes, I can't just speak just because I think that this is what I think might be. And so I remember one uncle took that very highly and he respected that very, very much. He goes, I respect that very, very much. And I said, because my tongue is, uh, you know, will be held accountable <laughs> for everything that I say. So just like I'm here for that. And it goes a long way as well, like you said, you know, I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, the only, only one that is all knowing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So individuals out there cannot know everything, you know, and so um, just like I'm here for that. Um, we'll go on to the next question. SubhanAllah, time is like going and we're, <laughs> we're just halfway there. Um, okay, so the next question is, uh, is there, is it preferred for a woman to stay home from the mosque? My husband told me that for Ramadan, I cannot come with him uh, to the uh, Tarawi um, if they are having it. Is this true, what he said? And so I saw this really quick in Morocco when I spent 10 days of Ramadan. <laughs> I remember I was so excited to go to the mosque in a Muslim country during Ramadan. And I was like, they were like, whoa, where are you going? <laughs> I said, to that away. Um, so alhamdulillah, eventually I got to go, but the space was so tiny that really, uh, like, I didn't want to go anymore because people were stepping on you. But um, I think a lot of it is cultural. Am I, am I correct, um, Stadisa? So when it comes to this uh, this this concept of women uh, staying home, uh, a lot of context is is really required to to navigate it appropriately. Um, oftentimes, the proof that's used for women supposed uh, being supposed to stay home is the verse from Surah Al Ahzab, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is addressing uh, Umar Hadith al Mu'minin, talking to the mothers of the believers and telling them their criteria as the wives of the Prophet And even though that was uh, like the case, it, it does require context. It doesn't mean that they were locked in their homes all the time, that they weren't allowed outside or anything like that. It's just that um, as the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was some of the type of fitna and the type of issues and stuff that could come up with women, especially in that society and in the, in the, in the, in the climate that they lived in was very, very difficult. So what happens is this verse gets appropriated to all women, which is weird. I've always found it odd because the Ummah had to meaning they also wore niqab, but we don't apply niqab to all women. Why would you apply that to stay home, but you don't apply niqab? Or why would you apply, you know, uh, like even with the voice, uh, you know, how they would change their voice when they would speak to men so that the men uh, who have diseases in their heart wouldn't be like, oh, that's the voice of the wife of the prophet. You know, they start to, you know, think some extra things. We don't apply that for most uh, for most women in, in most situations, you know, uh, except when it comes to the discussion of reciting Quran and things like that. But even then, it's far more nuanced and it's not really, uh, you know, pertinent to this discussion. Uh, we need to like take kind of a systematic approach to this because in a in a relationship, you don't want to weaponize the religion against your spouse. That's extremely unhealthy. It's not very, uh, you know, both as a man. You don't want to weaponize hadith. You don't want to weaponize ayat against your, your, your wife. And as a woman, you don't want to go and say, oh, the sheikh said, the ustad said, the, the mufti said, the imam said that I can go. And now you add like a third party to, <laughs> into the discussion. And, and, it, and it can get really unhealthy. And you got to know, shaitan is an open enemy to all of us. And so shaitan will even take uh, knowledge 
something beneficial and he will warp it against you and try to make it as a means of dissension in the home. And we ask Allah to keep us safe from that. I mean, I mean so uh, before we even get to the ruling, we ask Allah to keep peace between the husband and the wife. And we ask Allah to shield the homes, uh, you know, keep them safe against our open enemy, Shaytan. Allahumma. I mean. uh, segwaying from that to um, the, the husband and the wife should be able to have a, a conversation about, you know, if she wants to go, uh, you know, him letting her go, accommodating her, so on and so forth. Um, and, and putting her in a position where he can accommodate her because it is it is indeed permissible for her to go to the masjid for a couple of weeks. You know, even the wife of Umar ibn al-Khattab, she went to the masjid. Some of the companions, they said, you know, he doesn't like you to come. And she said, it doesn't matter because the Prophet saw them. He said that women can go to the masjid. Don't prevent them from the masjid. And this is a well-known hadith. Don't prevent the women from the masjid. If they want to go, let them go. But obviously, yeah, the culture plays a role. But you got to understand, when you marry someone, you marry their culture too. And men are allowed to have their preferences. Now, sisters, if you don't want to marry someone who wants you to stay at home, cook and clean, so on and so forth, then, then make sure you vet this before you get married. Okay? <laughs> and if y'all want to have marriage workshop, we make it happen, inshallah. Okay? <laughs> because it, it, is, it is okay for him to have his preference. If he wants someone who does the dishes before the food is cooked, however he, that works, it's his preference. It's his preference. He can, he's allowed to prefer, just like if you want to marry someone who, who allows for you to work a full-time job and goes on to be the world's leading neurophysiologist who stands in 12 hours for surgery, then that's your prerogative. You can find a man who will accept that from you. Now, if you've already made the commitment and you already till death do us part, then that means that you, uh, we don't believe in sacrifice. We believe in compromise. We believe in accommodating, you know, because sacrifice implies that you lost something to give and, and that is never good for the heart, right? So, you know, to accommodate someone, look, if it's if it's easy for him to accommodate you coming to the masjid, then we ask the husband, accommodate. If it's easy for you to accommodate him by staying at home, then we ask you to accommodate him. According to people's preferences, because people are entitled to them. Sometimes what I prefer may not be what you prefer, but it's okay. I can accommodate you sometimes, you know. And so if, if going to Tarawi is something that's really important to you, then we would hope that there would be a conversation that allows for him to accommodate this uh, for you. But if you know your husband is really going to be like, no, you need to stay at home, blah, blah, blah. Even if he's wrong about the ruling, whatever, accommodate him. You're going to get more reward praying at home anyways. And, and, and this is a part of the reason why, like, culturally, yes, you will find some demographics do not let the woman go to the masjid. They take the hadith. The origin is, is, is Quran and Sunnah. But, you know, culture blurs those lines with time, right? So, yes, uh, the woman gets more reward praying at home. Uh, yes, you know, the woman does not have the obligation of ever stepping foot in the masjid, different from men. We have an obligation to it. So between you getting more reward at home and between the obligation of men praying uh, in Jama'ah at least once a week for Jum'ah or depending on, you know, the usul that you use to derive the ruling, also like praying all of your five salawats in Jama'ah, so on and so forth, 27 times the reward, trying to max out in Ramadan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Origins in the religion, true. But with culture, it becomes, no, don't come at all, period. You don't have to be here, and you get more reward at home, becomes, <laughs> stay at home. You're not allowed, right? So you can see how with time, the, the, the verbiage changes, and, uh, you know, culture plays an influence in that. At the end of the day, try to be accommodating. This is the key for any, any marital happiness. You have to be accommodating of one another. You have to be considerate and, uh, you know, be willing to sometimes uh, you know, as, as our sheikh said, in, 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 a, in a marriage, someone at some point has to be a customer. <laughs> in marriage, someone at some point, because you have fetch, kasra, and dhamma. You can't have two, two fetas and a dhamma. Now, you, some, somewhere along the way, we need a kasra. Someone has to go under, right? Mm -hmm. And so whenever you see that this person is water, uh, you know, uh, whenever this person is fire, you have to be the water, you know? And, and that is, uh, you know, through the prophetic guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When uh, Safiya sent the food to the house of Aisha, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was there with guests and she broke the food out of anger, he did not become fetha in that situation. He became kasla. He cleaned up the food. He didn't say anything to her about it. He didn't reprimand her in front of the guests. He didn't, uh, why did you do that? No, no. He became the kasra. He cleaned it up, smiled. You know, your mother, she just gets a little bit jealous. <laughs> so, uh, if he can be the kasra in a situation like that, dealing with jealousy between co-wives, then surely we can be the kasra when it comes to Tarawih. <laughs> I can definitely attest to that because, um, you know, I'm 
married to someone from another culture. And so you do run into those situations where that culture does um, come in and cause some issues. And I think the most important part is like you said, compromise, compromise and communication. And if you use the proper tone and you know about your religion, this is why it's so important to know about your own Dean. Why do you believe what you believe that you're able to communicate that and that person um, will reciprocate much better when you use the proper tone. So even though it feels like they may be um, stepping on your rights or whatever, the way you bring it forth to them is going to make a difference in the outcome. So um, very good you advice, know, thank you. Americans have our culture too, you know, white culture, black <laughs> culture, Hispanic culture. We, we, we all have expectations too. And you looking at black, white, and Hispanic, we all have our expectations exactly. as well, so. Latina, Latina. Latina, Latina, Latina. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the American one is known to be the loud mouth. So <laughs> Man, we're the firecracker. Oh. <laughs> yes, we all have our culture. So we all have That's to right. keep it along together. Right? You got to be the customer. You got to be the customer. <laughs> Michelle. Um, okay. So our next question, um, this is also just something, um, you know, sometimes people lose their family or their friends when they embrace Islam. Uh, this sister says, I love the faith, but I feel so alone since I reverted to Islam. I lost my family and most of my friends. Is this how all Muslims feel when they embrace Islam? I'm not sure I can deal with this feeling. So I see this a lot um, in the convert chats where they are considering leaving Islam because they feel so alone and isolated and they don't feel like they have that connection. So what advice would you give her? First off, I, I really empathize with this feeling. Since I became Muslim, I felt this feeling. I lost all of my friends that I had before Islam. I was always popular before I became Muslim, always fit in uh, no matter where I went. After becoming Muslim from community leaders to children and everyone in between, we've always faced uh, isolation. We've always felt you know, uh, evil suspicion. We've always faced uh, people questioning this, that, and the third about you. We've always faced it from day one, and and it's never gone away. And and uh, at one point in time, it got so bad that I thought that I was just going to leave being a part of the Muslim community. And I made dua to Allah in the masjid. Um, oh Allah, please just give me just give me one good friend. And I've learned with time to stop being so specific with my dua. <laughs> but I, I I was crying in the musalla alone. Uh, you know, I've been accused of everything from being a spy to how you don't, you know, you didn't study this much or, you know, how did you do this or, you know, the, the, all types of stuff always been looked at through a critical eye. It doesn't matter where I've been, doesn't matter what community, I've had my motives and everything, everything you can imagine question about me. And it's never easy, right? Uh, especially from respected people in a community or even like youth or families, like it's rough, it's rough. So I made this to I, oh, love, please give me one good friend. And I walked out of the masjid and I saw someone standing at the door because it was raining outside. And I just started talking to him. I was like, why, did, why, why are you waiting for a ride? You know, just being cordial me. He's like, nah, it's raining. And I just dropped like a Chinese proverb. Some people walk in the rain, other people get wet. And he's been my best friend ever since. You know, Allah, Allah answered the door before I even put my hands down by sending rain down from the sky to make me meet my one friend, you know. So uh, and, and then obviously, alhamdulillah, for opportunities like embrace, you know, but uh, obviously in the pandemic, you know, you don't make friends in group chats, especially when most of the time people are talking in a group chat is to share something that's happening or to ask a question, you know? So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the human beings aren't designed to connect this way. Your feelings are not odd, okay? The prophets went through this. They lost their families. They lost their communities. They lost access to their broader social networks when they became Muslim. And this is uh, what happens. It does happen, but, uh, do not be discouraged. The, the, the people that you have in your life are not a reflection of your relationship with Allah. And that's something that's important to note. Sometimes the closer you get to Allah, the less people you will find around you. you know? Sometimes the further away you are from Allah, the more people you will find around you. But which is better? Sometimes less is indeed more. And in Allah, waliyul mu'minin, Allah is the friend of the believer. And yes, sometimes you will find yourself like Yusuf alayhi salam alone in Egypt. He was the only Muslim in Egypt. From the time he was a child, he came there as a slave. But with patience, you may find that you're the king of your domain, the queen of your domain. Uh, you know, and, and people are coming to you because you become the beacon of light for Islam 
uh, wherever you are. So don't be discouraged. Uh, if you need to like reach out, you need to talk to someone one on one. If you're running through any mental or spiritual uh, distress or anything like that, you can have uh, them contact me through Y Slam. You can reach out to your sisters with uh, with with embrace. And we are here for you. You know, um, none of us have to go through this alone. There's no such thing as suffering in silence. And uh, everyone's uh, fitna is a mountain in front of them. Everyone's trial is a mountain in front of them. But you don't have to climb that mountain alone. We're definitely here. Mashallah, mashallah. Thank you so much uh, for that commercial, uh, Usarisa. Perfect. <laughs> The plug in, no, but for reals, uh, brothers and sisters, I think now it's the time to plug in that do we do have support and we have support virtually. Um, and as Usad Isa said, you know, why Islam is here, Embrace is here, us sisters meet every Saturday, nine o'clock for two hours. Our group has grown internationally. Um, we've had shahadas, we've cried together, we laughed together, we learned together. And so, um, alhamdulillah. Please don't feel alone, and we're definitely here for you. One of my biggest models is I rather have four quarters and a hundred pennies, and and so it, it's very important to understand that you know quality is better than quantity. You know, like Usarisa, pray for one good friend, uh, mashallah. You know, that's the one that perhaps is going to be his neighbor in Jannah. And may all we all be in neighbors in Jenna. I mean, I mean. but um, yeah. So our next question is: um, I have a health issue that prevents me from fasting in Ramadan. How can I wake uh, the many blessings Ramadan? I think, huh? I think how can I make? I did a. Oh, okay. How can I make the many blessings Ramadan uh, had to offer when I cannot fast? Um, and so I know I've received this question as well. Um, so how do we we spark that as well, that that enthusiasm, knowing that you cannot fast this Ramadan uh, because of, you know, health issues. And 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 so what can we do? Uh, first off, we empathize with this uh, condition that you have. And we ask a lot to make it a means of uh, uh, purification for you. We ask a lot to remove it from you 100% and to cure you of it and to uh, make it easier than easy on you and your loved ones. Allahumma amin. We're sorry mm -hmm. to hear that this is uh, something that, that you have to deal with and, ex and, and experience, but also trust the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be that if you did not have this thing that prevents you from fasting, that the difficulty of fasting would make you not fast. So then you would not have a concession uh, for the fast itself. And so Allah's wisdom is infinite and unending in so many different ways. And you may think to yourself, well, you know, no, if I didn't have this, that uh, then I would be able to. But Allah knows and we do not. And, um, you know, the grass is not always greener on the other side, too. Sometimes the things that we wish for ourselves, as Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, sometimes it could be something that you hate, uh, you know, but in it comes a great deal of good. It could be something that you love it, and it, there's no good for you in it, you know. So, um, you know, we do empathize with the fact that you have it, but we also uh, ask you to be patient with Allah's decree in it. Uh, and trust his wisdom for why this is uh, it for you. Just because you can't fast and because you have a, a medical excuse not to fast does not mean that you don't get the reward. First off, when you do the kafara, when you do the expiation for it, and uh, you know to get specifics on that, we encourage you to ask your local imam if you do not have access to a local imam or someone that you can ask these questions to, feel free to reach out to or Embrace and we can assist with those questions. If you join the Embrace WhatsApp chat, you can ask questions and there are people there who can answer those questions for you. Um, you know, through doing the kafara, but through doing the expiation for not being able to fast because you have an excuse, you have a ruksa, you have a concession for it, you get the reward. You get the same reward. You're not being deprived in the least. The Quran is still there for you. And it is the month of Quran. Generosity is still there for you. Uh, giving sadaqah and helping people. And this is the month of sadaqah. Um, you know, tarawih is still there for you. Uh, and, and praying tarawih is not something that uh, culturally it's become something that we only do in jama'ah because you can pray tarawih by yourself and you don't have to do the whole quran to pray tarawih you can read the surahs that you know every single night you don't have to do 11 rakats you don't have to do 13 you don't have to do 21 or 33 you can you can just do three at home by yourself and it's still tarawih and especially in a pandemic where you know the the social element of ramadan is gone Honestly, it's a bit of a blessing in disguise because we can focus more on the spiritual element than the social element. So the rewards of Ramadan are still there and waiting for you to reap them. If the onus of it was on fasting, 
then the only thing Prophet Sallallahu would have done was fast. But we know from the narration of Ibn Abbas that in the month of Ramadan, he became more generous than a wind. You know, wind, it, it spreads pollen, it spreads seeds, it, it, it pushes the rain. You know, the benefits of wind, we witness it every single day. So it became more generous than the wind itself and given in charity and so on and so forth. So the opportunities of charity, the opportunities to connect with Quran, even if the only chapter of Quran that you know is Fatih, for every letter, ten asana, times 700, times infinity, Allah wills. Recite Fatiha, you still get the reward. Every rakah that you pray is elevating you. Uh, pray, uh, you know, you can still pray duha, you can pray tahajjud, you can pray qiyam al-layl, you can pray your sunan for uh, for the other, for the obligatory prayer. You can make more dua in the month of Ramadan than maybe you would outside of it. You can seek Laylatul Qadr, which is uh, the worship that you do on that night, translates to, you know, uh, 1,000 months of worship for you. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu informed us that whenever, because our ummah doesn't live as long as the ones that came before, we will still be able to compete with them in reward because of Laylatul Qadr. So we don't live for long periods of time, like, uh, you know, say, for example, the people of Nur. Nur lived not, uh, given Dawah for 950 years, right? <laughs> he given Dawah for, so how long did he live? Only Allah knows, right? Um, so uh, we, our Ummah will still be able to compete with the likes of theirs because we have things like this. You can still get all the reward in the, in the world. Don't, don't feel like you're being deprived. No, rather Allah to put you in a position to thrive. And Allah knows. Mashallah. Um, we have one sister here um, asking where she can go to listen to the Q&A that she missed. So go ahead. It's on the Facebook page. It'll still be there. You can go back and watch the live. Um, inshallah, it'll be on YouTube as well once we get tech savvy there. Um, and we had a couple other viewers. One person asked a question. Um, and I don't know, do we do we want to go ahead and ask another question? I know we're running into our hour right here. We want to finish them just because these two other questions, I promise that they would, okay. they would be, they would be answered. <laughs> All righty. So we will go on with the next question here that we had um, from a sister. And let me pull that up. Um, so this one, I had a miscarriage at 12 weeks. Do I have a baby waiting for me in Jannah? First off, we uh, are sorry to hear about the loss of your, your child. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to restore, uh, you know, what you lost in for that that child be approved for you on the day of Deen that, that you, uh, you know, intended to, uh, expand the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to add another Muslim to this world and that that Muslim would have been a beacon of light for all of the people of this world and that all of the edger that you hope to attain to that child that Allah had already put it in your scales for you and that it's waiting for you when you meet your Lord on the day of judgment and greater still is waiting for you and for Dasa Allah Allahumma ameen. We're really sorry to hear about uh, the miscarriage and we ask Allah to, uh, you know, facilitate healthy children beyond this one and, and to make it easy on you physically, mentally and emotionally and any heartbreak, any uh, sadness, anything that you felt from that. We ask Allah to uh, make it a purification for you and to grant the heart peace. Allahumma amin. Amen. Really, really uh, does break the heart to hear about things like that. But again, we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite decree and uh, know that everything happens for a reason. So, um, inshallah ta'ala, you have a child waiting for you in Jannah. Inshallah ta'ala, that child is waiting for you with more in Jannah than you could ever imagine. And, uh, you know, what you went through in this world is just a means of attaining that greater reward in the hereafter. So, so uh, cling to the faith and cling to the path. And inshallah, you know, um, uh, what you seek through that and more is, is awaiting you. Um, as far as, like, uh, you know, dealing with miscarriage and stuff, of if any one of you, you know, knows someone who's gone through miscarriage or someone who uh, has dealt with that, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people. We have access to, to local counselors, licensed counselors, chaplains who, uh, you know, can help you through, kind of talk through that and kind of, you know, reach a place of not letting it go. You don't have to let go of loss, but being able to reconcile it and to be stronger as a result of it. And it's not weak uh, weakness to seek out a counseling or to seek out, you know, some type of spiritual advice uh, and things like that. So if uh, any of that is needed, please don't hesitate to reach out. We can uh, provide those resources to embrace it. Through our and um, as far as like, you know, whenever you lose a child, are they waiting for you in Jannah? Um, you know, we, uh, 
we we know that uh, that 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 the loss of life is is never something that is just like a, a random thing, and it's never something that doesn't have like a grand a grander meaning to it. So uh, we pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that that child is a is a means to to Jannah for you, and that that child that you wanted to have is waiting for you in Jannah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so um, alhamdulillah, I, I want to tell everyone to please um, share this. There's a lot of good information in today's episode. Make sure that you share this out, share with um, perhaps new converts or anyone that um, is going through any any type of trial um, that has questions about Ramadan. We covered an extensive amount of good information, alhamdulillah. And so we ask you to please share it out. Um, the next question, I think it's for all of us, um, simply because it, it's um, very broad. Uh, and we'll end with this. And I guess we'll go um, to surrender myself, and then we'll end with you. And you can close us out, um, Ustad Isa, uh, with your answer and with the dua, inshallah. So the question is, if you can give a new Muslim woman a piece of advice, what would it be? And again, we're in the month of, um, you know, his, history, uh, Women's Month. And so this is why these episodes were dedicated uh, this month. Uh, like we said uh, at the beginning, last week, we try to focus more on women's rights and uh, all of that, which is very important. Today, we were answering your questions. And next week, we're going to have some, um, some really important guests that will come and, and speak as well. Uh, we want to empower everyone, brothers and sisters. But since it's our month, we want to make sure that you know that you have a place here. And you have a place in the Ummah, and you have a place at Embrace. And like Ustad Issa said, and Sister Renda said, you're not alone. And you don't have to walk alone. Uh, Embrace was born for that reason, because we understand as reverts, converts, first generation Muslims, we understand how difficult it can get and it can be and very lonely. Um, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us, whether it's inbox, whether it's through our email, whether it's uh, Instagram, wherever, whatever platform that you utilize, uh, please make sure to reach out to us. So go ahead, Sister Renda. Yeah, and, and just ending it out, um, exactly what you said, I'm just going to reiterate, you're not alone. And if you feel you are, you have questions, you know, reach out to people. There's so much online now. And just even messaging, you know, someone to get that answer, whether that be on our embrace, why Islam, um, you know, just reach out and no question is dumb. I know a lot of people hesitate to ask questions. Um, because they think it's a silly question and it's not. I mean, if you don't ask, you're never going to know, right? So um, don't feel like you're alone. Way back in the days, way back when I embraced Islam, it was much harder than it is now. And, and alhamdulillah for organizations now that have put these, um, you know, these contacts together so that we can reach out when we need, when we need that support. Um, um... You know, for my sister who, you know, is new Muslima, first off, we uh, congratulate you on the greatest gift that a person can receive in this life, which is the guidance to Islam. There's nothing that makes a person more human than being Muslim. So it's an honor to be Muslim. And uh, sometimes you will run into people who try to make you feel like, uh, you know, being Muslim is like having a pet. Like it's a big responsibility, you know. Uh, and they tried to talk to you about everything that you should or should not do with your pet, Islam. Islam is not uh, something that you need to take care of. Islam is something that takes care of you. And don't ever let anyone convince you that it's the other way around through the information that they put on you, uh, through the things that they try to say is important to you. You see, uh, the first step of becoming Muslim is that shahada, the testimony of faith, because before you can do anything, the faith has to be in place. And um, by cultivating and watering the seed of faith in your heart, it will, it will flourish and it will bloom on your limbs. So don't ever, you know, identify through what you do and don't do. Because oftentimes as new Muslims, that becomes our first identifier. All the things that you give up to be Muslim. That's not what makes you more Muslim. Uh, adding the good of Islam is what will help you get rid of the bad of everything else. But giving up the bad of everything else does not necessarily automatically make you a good Muslim. So 
whether it be wearing hijab, praying, fasting in the month of Ramadan. Yes, these are things that we all must do. These are obligations and, and they are for your benefit. And don't let anyone convince you that they're not obligation, but don't let anyone else convince you that this is something that is uh, the key to your salvation exclusively. Don't let anyone tell you that the value of your Islam is exclusive through, exclusively through what they see you do. And don't let anyone convince you that the value of Islam is through only asking questions about it. Well, why does Islam say? Why does Islam say? Why does Islam say? Islam is not different than what Allah says, and Allah is the creator of everything that exists. So the same Allah that said, kun fair kun be, and it is, and that's the reason why what goes up must come down, is the same Allah that revealed the Quran from above the seven heavens through the angel Jibreel to the Prophet Muhammad over 23 years so that you can actualize your humanity by doing what he created you for. As he mentioned in Surah Tidariya, chapter 51, verse 56, he did not create you for any other reason except that you worship him. So being Muslim is about perfecting what's between you and Allah. And the more you align yourself with what Allah is pleased with, the happier you will be in this life and the greater pleasure you will enter into in the hereafter. Anyone uh, you know who understands this clearly will begin to put people around, their, uh, around themselves that help them actualize this. And, and, and slowly but surely, not through a sword, sever the connection and not through you know a knife, cut the connection, but rather organically, separate themselves from the people who take them away from this sure reality. From Allah we come, and to him we shall return. So if you are invested in the return to your Lord, then you will find it to be a great return indeed. And don't let anyone convince you that it's about anything other than that. So that would be my advice to my new sister in faith, and I hope that this advice is well received and well understood. We ask Allah for... Oh, go ahead. My bad. No, 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 mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Just real quick, um, you know, from Puerto Rico, Sister Alex, thank you for being here. From Bangladesh, we have just real quick shout out. We appreciate you supporting um, this program, and it's uh, because of you that we're here. Um, any questions that we missed in the chat, inshallah, we'll pull them up next time around. We plan to have a Q&A at least once a month because I thought this was very beneficial. And uh, inshallah, I think it's important for us to answer your questions. So Brother Richard, next time around, we'll answer your questions. And Sister Pam, go ahead and leave your questions. We'll make sure to um, answer them next time. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ustadi. So again, thank you so much for accepting. We really appreciate you. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and protect you and continue guiding every single one of us. Ameen. Mm -hmm. uh, can you close us out with a dua? And you guys, see you next week, inshallah. Tomorrow is our Friday reminder, and it's on Um Salama. So Sister Jackie is going to talk about Um Salama, very beautiful um, uh, story. So make sure to tune in tomorrow. And we have programs that we'll be, we will be posting throughout um, the weekend. So join us. And until next time, salam alaikum. Closes out Ustad Isa and Jazakallah here. Ulida ikhwati qaddama muqtidi qad jama'atu hamdi liman bi ni'matihi tamat bi alafi barakakumullahu rabbul alameen wa ja'alakum narwat al muwahidin ulikum wa judithum wa buqitum wa kufitum wa ani shaytani nuhitum anakullama bi hamdika shar wa la ilahi la anakul ayk a'udhu billahi minash shaytani nurajim bismillah ameen al-asri inni al-insan illa fi khut illa ladina amini wa amini salihati wa tuwasab al-haqi wa tuwasabah السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام.